So each month, over a billion people use WhatsApp to communicate with their friends and family. And last year, we launched end-to-end -end encryption built on top of the Signal protocol. And this means that our servers don't have any access to the actual message content that people are sending. If, if I send you a message, uh, the only person who can actually decrypt that message is you on your phone. Uh, WhatsApp servers can't do it, other phones can't do it, just you. And this has a lot of great security properties that I'm sure people here are, are familiar with. Um, but it seems like it, it might present an interesting challenge for spam detection, which has traditionally used uh, the actual message content to determine whether something is spam or whether it's fine. And actually, in, in December, Joe Bonneau gave a talk on the uh, challenges in secure messaging and, and actually specifically called out that spam and abuse is one reason that people choose not to go end to end. And in reality, we actually haven't seen this as a big problem. And, and as, as Damon alluded to, we actually reduced spam by about 75% around the time that we launched end to end encryption. And so, what I hope to show you today is kind of the mechanisms that we use to detect spam without knowing what people are saying, so that if you're considering launching end-to-end -end encryption, uh, you can cross spam detection off the list of concerns. So how do we detect spam that we can't actually see? Well, we've built a fairly robust spam reporting flow. Uh, when you get a message from someone that you don't actually know, there's a big report spam button there that, that you're welcome to click. And, and so this means that eventually we catch most spammers through reports. Uh, if you send a bunch of messages that people don't want, they're going to report you and we're going to ban you. We're going to kick you off of WhatsApp altogether. And, and so this means that we're not chasing after something that's completely invisible. Rather, we're trying to, to take something that eventually will happen, eventually we're going to catch you, and we're trying to just do it sooner. How can we do this before you sent uh, a whole bunch of messages to a whole bunch of people that they don't want? So I've, I've discussed spam a little bit, but what actually is this? Uh, what are some attributes that we've seen that are common across various different attacks? So almost tautologically, spam is a message that's unwanted. It's something that you wish you hadn't received. Um, and at the same time, spammers have some goal. Usually, they're trying to make money. And they do this by trying to get users to call a phone number or maybe visit a website. And this is, this is useful because it means if we make things expensive for them, their business model won't work and they'll go away. If it, if it costs them $11 just to make $10, they're not going to stick around for very long. And so as we're trying to build detection mechanisms and, and, and new approaches, we have to think about this and say, how, how, does, how does this new approach make life, uh, make things more expensive for spammers? And so there's a corollary to this, then, that if most people don't want to receive these messages, but spammers want people to do something as a result of them, the small percent of people that actually are interested and go to the web page or whatever, if you want a large number of absolute people to do that, you have to send a whole lot of messages. And so the majority of spam that we see is very high volume. They, they, they reach out to a whole lot of people. And if you want to do high volume actions on the internet, you kind of have two options. You can either convince a bunch of people to do it for you, or you can write a script. And the, the majority of the spam that we see chooses the latter option. They've got computers that are sending the spam for them. They're not, um, they're not sitting there typing on a phone hunched over in a basement somewhere. And finally, WhatsApp doesn't use passwords. So we've, we've had a lot of discussion uh, the last couple of days about the problems with passwords and phishing and account compromise. Um, and so we kind of work around that by saying, look, when you sign up for WhatsApp, all you do is prove control over a phone number. And this is not a perfect authentication mechanism either, but it means that account takeover doesn't really happen at scale. And so if, if uh, an attacker wants to get control of a bunch of accounts in order to send spam, the way that they do it is by creating accounts with the, with the explicit purpose of doing that. They create malicious accounts, not compromising real accounts. So these are the constraints. This is kind of the, uh, the way the problem looks. How do we actually attack this? Well, like, like many cases in engineering, we take something that's hard. How do we detect this spam? And we break it down into simpler problems, and we solve those instead. So at a high level, we say we've got some action that we want to know if it's spam or not. Um, maybe it's a message sent. Rather than looking at that directly, let's say, Let's look at the sender. Are they a spam account? Um, and we can go further down and we can say, well, are they automated somehow? Um, and, and even more specifically, we can say, are they using a spam client? Um, if, if they're trying to do things that are automated, chances are they're trying to use a script or they've got some custom software that's actually connecting and doing this. And, and as we work our way down this uh, hierarchy of, of sort of simplified problems, we generally are able to catch accounts faster. So what I mean by that is, is closer to registration time. If we can tell that you're using uh, a fake client, we can usually do that very shortly after you've registered before you even get a chance to send spam messages to people. 
Um, and this is great, because it means we can, we can drive up their costs before they've had a chance to generate any revenue from one of these accounts. Um, but the trade-off, as we go down the same way, um, these approaches generally tend to be less effective. So the percent of all spam accounts that we can catch with, with each one goes down as we work our way down. And in reality, none of these is perfect. Uh, and, and so we have classifiers that target kind of each level in this, uh, in this hierarchy. And that's generally how we approach things. <clears throat> so how do we actually do this? What is, what, how does the system work? What does this actually do? Um, in general, we run synchronous classifications. So some action comes in, like someone is sending a message, let's say. And we classify it and we come up with an answer, usually within a few hundred milliseconds. So we're not doing big offline batch processing. We're doing things in real time. And an action comes in, we have a few pieces of data about it, like how long has the user been on WhatsApp? How long since they registered? How many messages have they sent in the last 30 seconds? Things like that. And we send those into a classifier. The classifier spits out a, an answer that's either good or bad. And we interpret that as either we're gonna allow this action or we're gonna ban this account completely from WhatsApp. And in general, we take this very definitive approach. Either you're allowed to do what you're doing or we're gonna kick you off altogether. And sometimes people ask, why don't you hedge a little bit and say, um, maybe if you think a spammer is, uh, if you think a message is spam, just drop it and don't deliver it to the recipient. And there's, there's two problems with approaches like this. The first one is if you think you're gonna trick the spammers by not delivering their messages, you're wrong. The people who are able to get to this level are, are, are already sophisticated and have, uh, have their systems instrumented so they know if their messages aren't getting delivered because they're not gonna be making money. And the second reason is if, if a real user gets incorrectly flagged as a spammer, then they send a message to their friend, they think it got delivered and actually got dropped on the floor. And this is terrible. This is the kind of the worst case for a messaging app. You want it to work all the time. And so instead of building something that has this kind of subtle brokenness when we make mistakes, instead we opt for very, very obvious brokenness. Um, we say, you're banned, you're definitively, you can't use it. And if you think we've made a mistake, you can write in, and I'll talk more about that later. So I didn't really talk about the actual classify step at all. Um, the majority of the, the systems that we use to actually do this are machine learned, and I'm gonna talk about that um, in just a second. And again, the, the input is a collection of features that represent whatever the action is. So someone's sending a message, what's the information we have about that? And the output is either we allow the action or we ban that user altogether. So how do we make machine learned classifiers that do this? And I, I won't go into the, the details of tuning classifiers or anything, but I wanna talk about how we actually use that. So we need uh, basically two things in order to create one of these. We need a list of past actions, and, and for each one, the collection of features. Whoops. We need the collection of features, the information that we had about that action. And this is uh, relatively straightforward to, to keep track of. We can, we can just write it to a log when we see an action come in. But we also need a label. We need to say whether this particular, act, particular action was ham, if it was legitimate, or if it was spam. And that raises an interesting, an interesting question. If we knew that it was ham or spam at the beginning, we would have just blocked it and we wouldn't have this problem. So how do we actually come up with these labels? How do we, how do we tell the machine that's trying to learn something what's right and what's wrong? We use two different ways of generating these, these sources of truth and, and generate independent classifiers with them. And, and, and the first mechanism we use is sort of leveraging the fact that eventually we're gonna catch all spammers. And <clears throat> Given that we have this pretty robust spam reporting flow, chances are if you send spam, you're gonna be reported, and if you're reported, you're gonna be banned. And so then we can say, for a given user who is banned, every message that they sent before then, every classification that we did on their account, was an opportunity we had to prevent further spam that we failed to take. So we're gonna label all of those things as bad. All of those actions were from someone who we later on determined was a spammer. And any action from someone who's never been banned is good. And this isn't perfect, there's some noise in the labels, but we found it to be actually pretty effective and the majority of our classifiers are built on this, this mechanism of, of, of saying who's bad and who's not. The other approach is, is kind of moving down our chain of reductions to talk about whether we're talking to a spam app. You know, are we talking to someone who's running uh, our app on a, on a normal phone or someone who's written a script or, or something like that? And there's a handful of these, these kind of uh, uh, fake clients that people use to talk to WhatsApp, and, and some of them are on GitHub. This is an example. Uh, and these tend to be non-trivial because we don't, uh, most of our communication doesn't actually happen over HTTP. We have our own, our own protocol. And if you want to get all the end-to-end -end bits working, like it's a fair amount of engineering work. Um, and so the, the people who build these are actually not bad folks. They're not spammers. Um, but unfortunately, the majority of the usage that we see from these kinds of clients uh, is spam. 
And, and you can see they, they use issues to, to keep track of things that are happening on their, um, on their apps. And, and this is an example of someone who comes on and says, hey, I need a script. I want to send 50,000 messages a day. And one of the maintainers uh, comes in and says, wait a minute, you're a spammer. Get out of here. We don't want to help you. So the people writing these are good folks, but unfortunately, they're used primarily uh, for spam. So OK, we're running on the server here. We're the, we're the green people on the right. How do we actually determine if the person who's executing some action, who's, who's sending a message, is, is, is running one of these fake clients or running our actual app? Um, and we have a handful of different mechanisms for this, um, none of which is particularly robust. So if a spammer knew how these worked, um, it would be relatively easy for them to work around it and say, um, OK, I just got to change x, y, and z, and they won't be able to detect me anymore. And so the key to success, the key to actually having these be useful for us, is we only use them for providing those training labels. We never take direct action on them. So to put it another way, if, if we detect that you're not running our app when you send some message, we'll just write that down. And we'll say, this action came in, and it came in from a fake app. Um, but we're not going to take action on that directly. And, and in this way, we avoid providing a feedback loop that attackers can use to say, let, let me tweak this, let me tweak that, until the thing stops detecting me. Um, and, and these actually provide more trustworthy labels than the first one. Um, so I said there's some noise in the labels of people that we eventually banned, because we don't always wait until eventually. Um, but in this case, we know kind of right when an action is happening, whether you're on a fake client or not. And, and we can use this to train classifiers that we relaunch in an automated way uh, every day. And, and this, this approach is actually quite effective. You can look at those same GitHub issue trackers and see people coming on here and saying, hey, like, as soon as I start sending messages or register, um, I get blocked. Like, can, can you fix this? And, and so these are, these are spammers that we're, that we're able to prevent from getting onto the platform at all. So let's come back to our training data. We talked about, we talked about how we come up with those labels. Um, but I kind of glossed over the features. What, what are the actual values that we have here? And I want to talk about a couple different mechanisms we use for this. Um, <clears throat> so generally, we use behavioral features. So we want to quantify what is it that makes a spammer a spammer. And how do they generate actions? You know, when they're sending a message, uh, how do they do that? And how do the, the recipients actually respond to those actions? If, if they send someone a message, does that person ignore it? Do they send a message back? Do they block them? Do they mark them as spam, et cetera? And we want to classify this behavior altogether because we don't have any, any message content. We have no ability to look at what people are actually saying. So let's talk through some examples of what we, how we actually do this. Um, the simplest approach is looking at the, the reputation of the things that uh, an actor is using. So for example, uh, all these actions are coming in from the internet, and if you want to connect to the internet, you need an ISP, you need an internet service provider. And, and we'll keep track of what ISP people are using by looking at the autonomous system number of how they're connecting to us. And there was a talk about this yesterday, actually. So we call this the ASN, and it's basically the, the network that you're using to connect to WhatsApp. And if we look at all the people that we've seen send a message from the ASN that you're using in, say, the last day, and then we can say, what percent of those people did we later ban? So maybe we've seen 20 people that were using your ASN in the last day, and we've already banned 12 of them. This is like pretty suspicious. Chances are, if we see a new person coming from here, they're likely to be a spammer. And of course, we can generalize this. It doesn't just work for ASNs. Uh, we can also look at your net block, a, you know, a more precise uh, description of, of where you're coming from on the internet. And maybe we've seen eight people from your net block, and we've already banned five of them. Or we can look at things like your phone prefix. So if we take your phone number that you use to sign up and we cut off the last two or three digits, um, and we say how many people have sent messages from this kind of uh, this phone prefix, and again, that might be 30 people and we've already banned 23 of them. So a person whose numbers look like this is very likely to be a spammer. And we can generalize, like I was saying, the thing we're aggregating over, the ASN, et cetera. We can also generalize the notion of banned to any kind of negative feedback. Maybe we say, of all the people we've seen on, on this net block, what percent of them have been marked as spam? And the key to success here is that it forces the attacker to buy more of these things. And generally, that isn't, that isn't free. If, if you're using one ISP and you have to broaden out to more of them, either you've got to go and buy more contracts, or you've got to pay for more proxies, or you've got to rent someone's time on a botnet. Um, or if you need to get more phone numbers or phone number prefixes, you might have to go and buy some cards from different carriers, which is operationally more expensive, more difficult. So that's the first approach. Another one that we use is we look at the probability of a given action. And, and sort of intuitively, the vast majority of stuff that happens on WhatsApp is not spam. It's totally normal people. And so if a new action comes in and it's kind of close to everyone else in the, the space of these features, um, then chances are that it's fine, it's normal. But if something is a big outlier and it's way far away from everyone else, if it's improbable, then it's more likely that that's going to be spam. 
And the way that we actually do this is we look at conditional probability between the uh, various categorical features, various um, things, again, that, are, that the user sends in. So, so to, for a concrete example, let's say that uh, given that I'm using a phone from the United States, a phone number from the United States, what's the probability that the network I'm connecting from is in India? That probability might be relatively low, and that could be suspicious. And again, we can generalize this to any different kind of features. Uh, for example, we could say, given that I'm using the app in Finnish, what's the probability that I'm using a Nokia phone? And again, generally lower is a little bit more suspicious. And we found these features to, to consistently perform well in, in the machine learning classifiers that we train. So I spent a lot of time talking about how we do things, but what are the actual effects? What has the output of this, all this work been? And, and this is a graph of the spam reports, the sort of high confidence spam reports that we got in the three months around when we uh, announced that end-to-end -end encryption was fully rolled out last year. And you can see we started this period with uh, about X spam reports per day. And we did some work. We hired some new people. Um, Pavel is in the audience somewhere, and, and he, he helped uh, kind of make us better at things, launch some new classifiers, and we cut this in half. And a few weeks after we got it to about half X, we announced that end-to-end -end encryption was rolled out. And to be fair, we hadn't been using any text features before this either. Um, but the effect of rolling out end-to-end -end was basically nothing. Things, things climbed up a little bit. We got a little bit more spam over the, um, the next few months. But we did some more work. We launched some more classifiers. And we cut it back down to a, by a factor of two again. So we ended up this three-month time span with a quarter, uh, three-quarters decrease in the spam that we were seeing. And we've stayed roughly at that level since then. But this would be easy to do if all we did was ban everyone who even looked a little bit suspicious. And so we've got to keep ourselves honest somehow. This is a graph of the same time range, those same three months, where this is appeals. So these are people who we banned them, and they said, wait a minute, why did you do that? I'm a real user. They wrote in, and they said, hey, help me get back into my account. And we've got a great customer support team uh, who, who responds whenever people send things in like that and says, oh my god, you're right, we made a mistake, we're going to let you back in. Or potentially, no, no, you're definitely a spammer, we, we banned you for a reason. Um, and this is a graph of how many people wrote into us saying, why did you ban me, that was a mistake. And the, the colors here are broken down by what the classifier was that actually banned people in the first place. And so you can see, we started out this time period with a, with a certain number of appeals. And the blue classifier was performing terribly, right? It was catching some people, but a lot of them were writing in. And so we basically dialed that back and launched new, much higher performing classifiers and cut the number of appeals in half over the same time span. So during the three months when we launched end, -end encryption, we cut spam by three quarters and we cut the number of incorrect decisions, the number of incorrect bans by half. And so the moral of the story here is if you have well-instrumented behavioral features and you have effective labeling mechanisms, it's totally possible to detect spam without any access to message content in an end-to-end -end encrypted world. Thanks. Thank you.